At 46 years of age, I am finally building my own dream 8-bit microcomputer. Now, why am I doing this, right? I mean, this is a new retro computer. It sounds like a useless contradiction in terms. Well, I have four motivations. The first one is I would like to contribute uh, an educational platform to students and hobbyists alike. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to help demystify computers. Most people today use computers without having a clue what is actually happening. So they think it's magic. And then uh, preposterous and ridiculous ideas that get promoted by the media today, such as in series like Black Mirror and in movies about AI, th these ridiculous ideas about computers becoming conscious or you uploading your consciousness into computers. Well, this ridiculous stuff sounds plausible because computers seem like magic to most people, but if we provide a platform that even hobbyists can dig into and see what's happening down to the individual gate, to the individual flip-flop, then that, that mystification should disappear, hopefully, or I want to contribute to, 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 to helping do that at least. I also would like to advance retro computing back to the future because you see, uh, we have a finite limited number of machines we can play and fool around with. Those were the computers built back in the day. So there is no novelty in retro computing. So what if we could build new computers today according to the design style, design principles and technology of the past? Then uh, a dream of mine would be realized. I would like to have a ZX82 or a ZX83 or a Commodore PET 2002 or 2100 or a TRS-85. Um, uh, because those were the machines I grew up with and loved and uh, that world is not progressing anymore and maybe we can help it progress again. And finally, I would like to have fun and realize my childhood dream of building my own microcomputer. I went to, to computer engineering school at 17, I had just turned 17, uh, based on this dream. That was my motivation to go to engineering school. And once I graduated, I landed in all kinds of processor design projects. I have come up with technology for processors, then after years and then ended up in, in semiconductor manufacturing and contributed to building machines like lithography. Um, but I never actually built my own computer, which was the reason I did this whole thing to begin with. Now that I'm sort of semi-retired from, from technology, um, I would like to finally realize that dream uh, during my 47th year. <laughs> I just turned 46 uh, recently. Anyway, what are the requirements I'm put forward for, for, for Cerberus, for, for this computer I want to build? Well, first of, first of all, it should be an open and fully documented design down to the gate level. I want people to be able to know exactly what's going on everywhere, not at a high level of abstraction, but down to the gate, down to the flip-flop, because this is what I think uh, uh, contributes to, to, to educating people about what computers are. I like to use a retro style not only because I like, I love it, um, but because it makes it easy for hacking and tinkering with it. Uh, for instance, if you use through-hole components uh, uh, or, or, or PLCC chip packages or DIP chip packages, dual inline packaging and sockets, it's much easier to swap chips around, to take out a chip, reprogram it and put it back in. So I will go for that. Uh, I will use uh, electrically erasable programmable ROM instead of mask programmable ROMs or one-time configurable ROMs. Again, because it's easy to change, to tinker with it. SRAM instead of dynamic RAM because it, it leads to a much easier, simpler, more elegant architecture without all of that refresh logic. And in-system programmability for the configurable chips. Uh, instead of forcing people to buy an expensive chip programmer for one and a half thousand dollars, I want these chips to be reprogrammable uh, while they are sitting inside the board with a, with a JTAG cable. I will use Z80 and or 6502 CPUs. And the reason is we have known these CPUs for 45 years, even more uh, now. There is a wealth of documentation for them, a wealth of knowledge of best practices. People are used to them. So I will use them because this is supposed to be an educational platform and these are the best CPUs I could possibly use. They are still made and used to this day. They, they didn't become obsolete. 
I will put in pin headers uh, to make it easy to connect a logic analyzer, also an oscilloscope, but mainly a logic analyzer because these things have 16, 32 probes. So you can just connect them to the pin headers, it's easy to see what's going on. I will use programmable logic or configurable logic, uh, but I will limit myself to standard PLDs or complex PLDs, not FPGAs. And the reason is, uh, I don't want high-level synthesis here. I don't want to program these chips using VHDL or Verilog because these are very high-level uh, uh, hardware design languages which basically allow you to design or to, to, to specify uh, the, the functionality of the hardware. Uh, but you don't get to choose the implementation itself. These, these tools do it automatically. Once you tell them what the functionality is that you want, they choose the gates, uh, they, they, they place the gates where they are supposed to be, and, and that would basically hide the details of the architecture under an automated level of abstraction. I don't want that. And CPLDs are programmable at the gate level with languages like Couple that I will uh, uh, talk about uh, in, a, in a future episode. You can specify down to the gate level what you want and the tool only takes care of some housekeeping that, uh, that you don't care about anyway. And also I don't want to use surface mounted devices, which most FPGAs, FPGAs today are. And CPLDs you can still buy in DIP format or in PLCC format. Moreover, uh, this is supposed to be a platform, uh, an educational platform for engineers and hobbyists, so I don't want to force people to buy expensive hardware design tools to reprogram this stuff, to reconfigure this stuff. And CPLDs today, uh, you can just download for free uh, uh, tools to program them, so another reason to stick with CPLDs. I would design it according to a standard micro or mini ITX board format so people can just buy their preferred standard case and it will fit uh, into it. And because of usability, I will make one concession to more or less modern technology and that is the I.O. I may even use a small serial microcontroller, uh, much less powerful than, than the CPUs, uh, in order to control a PS2 keyboard or a flash drive. I will go for VGA because, you know, TVs and monitors today no longer have composite or RF uh, uh, inputs. So VGA is necessary, but I will build the VGA circuit using old-fashioned uh, retro logic uh, and, and, and design methods, as you're about to see. Now, I want to keep it simple and understandable, and that means the following. What I will design, Cerberus, will be a kind of next generation version of late 70s micros, such as the ZX80, the PET CBM, or the TRS80. In other words, what if we could go back in time and Commodore, or Sinclair, or Radio Shack, Andy, what if they had designed a follow up to those computers before they went into completely different uh, trajectories, like uh, Sinclair with the Spectrum? or, or, or uh, Tandy with the, 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 the Coco, which even had a different CPU uh, compared to the TRS, uh, TRS-80. They weren't, they weren't even compatible. Or Commodore uh, with the, the VIC-20, which had color, all kinds of other things. Uh, what if we had just a more cleanly designed version of those computers we loved? That's what I'm trying to do, a next generation of those old computers. And unlike the originals, I'm not going to sacrifice the cleanliness of the design uh, in order to cut costs. Uh, the ZX81 and the ZX80, for instance, especially the 81, they were a mess. Uh, they were not designed in a way that engineers are taught to design computers in engineering school. Um, they were works of art in themselves, very creative in the way they managed to reduce costs in an absurd way. And uh, kudos to them, to them for having managed that miracle of cost saving. But from an engineering perspective, those are horrible machines. And the way the ZX80 and 81 deal with bus contention, for instance, is, is downright ridiculous. That it works, it, it's a miracle, but th that's not a didactical architecture. So what I want to produce is an elegant, didactical architecture, designed as it should be done. And today we have the opportunity to do that. Um, and they should be backward compatible with the computer that inspired them, or 
it should be backward compatible. I'm building one Cerberus to begin with. I'm not talking about next versions yet. Um, and the reason is I want to be able to readily use an available code base. I don't want to start a new ecosystem and people have to go write code, it takes forever. No, there should be a readily available code base and then people can play with it and start doing things with Cerberus that they couldn't do with the older machines. And I'll tell you all about that soon. Character-based graphics, because that's also didactical for students. Students uh, in year three of computer engineering school, uh, they can put together a character-based graphics com uh, computer very quickly. It's easily understandable. So I want to stick to that. Even for me as a child, I understood character-based graphics. I could program that way. So that's what I want to cater for. Remember, this is an educational platform. It's not meant to give you super duper functionality. If you want the, the best graphics, the best colors, well, just buy a game PC, all right? You don't need to go for this, uh, for that kind of objective. And monochrome video because it makes the VGA circuitry a lot cheaper. And, uh, and that's a concession to cost I am willing to make, to, to design a retro VGA circuitry for full color uh, that would cost a little more. <laughs> and uh, okay, that concession I will make. I'll stick to monochrome video because that's what the ZX80, the PET and the TRS80 could do. They were monochrome machines. And most of them didn't have sound. I will make a concession and put deeper sound uh, in Cerberus. Now I want to use the weaknesses of those old machines as, as strengths in Cerberus. For instance, these old machines had very limited resolution. The character set was also very limited, very simple. Um, that's a weakness, but it opens an opportunity. Because there were so limited resolution, so few characters that could be displayed at once on the screen, uh, the required size of the screen memory was minimal. For the ZX81, it was one, less than one kilobyte, it was 700 something bytes. That opens up the opportunity for us to use expensive dual-ported VRAM for video memory. And th there are all kinds of benefits if we do that, as I'm going to explain uh, shortly. So that's, an that, that's a weakness we can turn into an opportunity, into a strength, and I plan to do that. Also, they had very simple, very short kernel codes or firmware or BIOS and uh, NIO options. And that opens up the possibility that one Cerberus could perhaps, I'm not promising this, but it could perhaps be compatible with more than one of the old machines, because we can just put a lot of uh, firmware code in a 32 kilobyte uh, uh, ROM. Character-based graphics also allow for what I think is the key, modest, but the key innovation of this retro architecture, which is to eliminate the distinction between character graphics and bitmap, bitmap uh, graphics. I'm going to explain this, I'll just leave it uh, at that for now. And that opens up the, uh, the opportunity to, to explore a whole new dimensions in terms of what the programmer can do to create graphics, the flexibility, the programmability, uh, the, the degrees of freedom the programmer would have compared to the old machines. This, this Cerberus would offer a lot more. So let me talk about that in details now. Like any computer architecture, Cerberus will have buses, like the data, the address, and the control buses. It will have a CPU, maybe more than one, but I'm not promising it yet. It will have RAM, but in this case, SRAM, for reasons I already explained, and uh, a double E PROM uh, for the firmware. Now, what I would do that's different from the old uh, architectures is I will use, as I mentioned, dual ported video RAM. And what that allows us to do is this domain here on one side of the VRAM can be completely independent and even asynchronous from the other side of the, v of the VRAM. If we are going to use, say, a video processor here, this video processor can access the VRAM on its own without even knowing what's going on on the other side. There are no contention uh, or arbitration issues like in the old machines. And, and, and these arbitration and contention issues were a key source for uh, problems and the complexity of those machines. With dual ported memory, we eliminate all that. There are two domains. They are asynchronous and completely independent of each other. Both can do what they need to do with the VRAM ignoring what the other side uh, is doing. Now, uniquely, I think, I'm going to make a, a character memory uh, that is also based on a dual-ported RAM. So when the computer boots, 
the EEPROM, which will have uh, the character definitions, first thing it will do will be to upload the character definitions into this uh, char uh, memory, this, this character memory. From that point on, the rest of the system will only access the character memory, if there is a video processor here, this processor also will only access this dual ported character memory to get the character definitions, not the EEPROM. And what this allows us to do is the programmer, by software, can change the character definitions here, not only prior to starting an application, but during the application. So as the application is running, the programmer can dynamically change the character definitions, which offers up the possibility of virtually uh, unlimited character sets, since they can be changed uh, on the fly, regardless of the video processor accessing uh, uh, this memory from the other side, as the two sides are uh, independent and asynchronous. So the limitation for, for how many characters you can define is basically how large your code memory is, how large this RAM is. And even given that, you can also uh, define characters algorithmically, like using uh, fractal algorithms. And, and that would give you basically an infinite set of, uh, of graphical characters uh, to play with. So in the extreme, you see, there will be v some VGA circuitry here, but uh, what you could do in the two extremes is, one, what you're used to, uh, to change uh, the image on the screen, suppose the screen uh, is right there, the screen information is sent from the VGA circuitry, to change what happens here, you could change the character tokens that are in the video memory. Basically, each of these tokens is an address to a character's uh, def definition here. So you could, you could change this token. At one point it's one token, say the letter A, and later on it's the letter B. And then this thing would just fetch the two definitions for A and B, and at one point there would be A here, and the next point there would be B on the screen and you're sticking to the same character definitions, just changing which characters you use. But on the other extreme, you could just list all the characters available here, all of them, and then never change uh, the video memory anymore, keep it uh, frozen, and all you do dynamically is you change the respective character definitions. If you do that, this is entirely analogous to bitmap mode. Uh, the characters are always the same, but that their definitions are changing on a bitwise uh, uh, level. And this is what I meant when I said this will blur the differences between bitmap, bitmap mode and character mode. And educationally, I think uh, th th this is quite helpful. You can do both things with the same architecture and the same programming paradigm. Now, from this point on, I'm going to focus on the VGA uh, circuit, and the reason is one, it's the first thing I'm building, and the reason for that is that uh, before I build the rest of the computer, I want to be able to see what the computer is doing, and for that I need the VGA circuit in between the computer and the monitor, so I can see what I'm doing uh, uh, here on this side. Also, the VGA circuitry is probably the most complex part of the computer, so I want to tackle it first uh, while I'm not frustrated yet with the problems <laughs> that are coming ahead. And since it's the first thing I'm going to do, it's the first thing I'm going to tell you about. But this will have to wait until the next episode, when I will share with you the details of uh, Cerberus 2080's video architecture.